Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, woohoo, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. At noon on Thursday, February 23rd, at the Eudora Welty House and Garden, Paige Mizell of Mizell Camellia Nursery will discuss varieties grown by Welty and have old-fashioned specialty camellias for sale while they last. That should be fun. And on Saturday, February 25th, we'll have a beginning African-American genealogy workshop at 10 a.m. next door in the Winter Building. Participants will learn to use census, county, Bible, cemetery, and other public records available in the department's archival collections. And the program is free, but space is limited, so you can contact the department to register. We have the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration coming up February 23rd and 24th. There are lots of great free panels and programs scheduled as part of it. And on March 2nd and 3rd, the Mississippi Historical Society will hold its annual meeting in these museums. There are brochures for both events uh, over by the coffee and snacks. Finally, I hope that you'll come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Danielle Dreilinger will present The Secret History of Home Economics. Today, I am delighted to welcome Robert S. McIlvain to present How 1964 Still Shapes Us. Robert S. McIlvain is Elizabeth Chisholm Professor of Arts and Letters and Professor of History at Millsaps College. He's the author of eight books and the editor of three. McIlvain is a contributing writer at Salon, and his articles and opinion pieces appear in the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, and other publications. McIlvain has received the Richard Wright Award for Literary Excellence, presented by the Natchez Literary and Cinema Celebration, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Mississippi Historical Society. Help me welcome Bob McIlvain. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Um, a lot of uh, people that I know out there, it looks like most of the crowd remembers 1964, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's something. Um, um, my, uh, my wife here, uh, the love of my life, um, also uh, the, the kind of the reason that I wrote the book, my son is here and I had this wonderful dedication, so I had to write a book to go with it. Uh, to, to Brett, a child of the 60s, born in 1988. So uh, um, that, that works uh, reasonably well. So uh, we'll get back to this image uh, of some of the uh, legacies of the 60s at the end, but I'll just throw it up there uh, now. Um, Sam Cooke's hopeful message in his 1964 song, A Change is Gonna Come, that change, as he said, had been far too slow, but he knew it would come, it was a timely uh, message. Change, massive change, was about to occur at a stunning pace. It was in 1964 that what we usually think of as the 60s began. Um, despite the third digit in the number, the first years of the 1960s were really still essentially part of the 50s. Speaking of numbers not necessarily matching up with what you would think they mean, uh, when I speak of 1964 in the book, I'm talking about a long 1964. I begin with the Kennedy assassination in 1963 and go into the late summer and early fall of 1965, kind of 1964 expanded. And if you look at it that way, uh, it's really a critical period in shaping America. Practically everything that is political, social, and culturally being disputed today has to do with the question of whether we should extend the changes that came in the long 1964 or turn them back. Make America great again and take America back essentially mean reversing the changes of the mid-1960s. Here's a useful way uh, to look at how that time relates to now. 1964 was a time of righting wrongs. Today, one of the two major political parties seems fully dedicated to wronging rights. 
reversing the progress initiated in the long 1964. The once grand old party has defined itself as both anti and anti-60s, against and before 1964. President Biden has undertaken an effort to restore the American social compact that was essentially started by Franklin Roosevelt during the New Deal and significantly furthered by Lyndon Johnson in his first two years in office. Since Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, the right wing has been chipping away at many of the gains of the 1960s and 1930s. And since Donald Trump took office, they have amped up to an extraordinary degree their opposition to the changes then and to try to destroy democracy because basically many of the things that the people who are at least financially behind the right wing want are clearly things that a majority of the public does not want unless you can fool them and get them to go along with you for other reasons. And they have finally reached the point where they've realized that democracy and their goals of making the rich ever richer are not compatible. Let's begin with a few images of the remarkable cultural changes that were occurring then. <clears throat> 1964 was, of course, the year of the British invasion. I um, define the British invasion as being in two waves, however beginning with the Beatles, who, uh, interestingly enough, the first articles about the Beatles were appearing. Uh, there was a, a, an announcement on a morning show on CBS on November 22, 1963, and they were supposed to talk about them again that evening, but events intervened. Um, but they, the Beatles uh, arrived in, in, in terms of their music being available at the end of January of 1964. They and the Numerous bands that followed them over the next couple of months uh, were seemingly different, but they weren't really threatening. You know, uh, um, they weren't talking about um, things that would really threaten the status quo. But then a second wave, starting with the first American album of the Rolling Stones in May, uh, was threatening, bringing back to America the blues that started in the Mississippi Delta moved on to Chicago and had messages such as the one that I put on the uh, album cover there. One of the songs on it was a cover of Slim Harpo's I'm a King Bee from I believe it was 1957. Well, I'm a King Bee buzzing around your hive. Well, I'm a King Bee baby buzzing around your hive. Yeah, I can make honey baby let me come inside. I should mention that I had music with all this, but uh, just about the time that I was sending it to Chris, I said, this is going over YouTube and they will take it down for copyright, and he said that's true. So I could sing if I could sing, but I can't, so. Uh, but anyway, that message goes way beyond, I want to hold your hand. The same week at the end of January that I want to hold your hand debuted at number one, a stunning film mocking the Cold War the policy of mad, mutually assured destruction, and especially mocking masculine insecurity was released. Stanley Kubrick's comedy about the destruction of the world, which doesn't seem like it should be a comedy, um, was denounced by cold warriors and many critics uh, when it came out. They were saying it should be banned, and uh, the surprise was that the reception was overwhelmingly favorable. In fact, it was the top box office hit for the first few weeks of uh, February in 1964. Um, that brings to mind that one thing that's different today from 1964 is that in 1964, probably the only notable Nazi in America was Dr. Strangelove. We have, have some more of them now. Um, the same uh, week that all that was happening, uh, another song that was truly revolutionary reached number two, uh, blocked only by the uh, Beatles that same week debuting at number one, and stayed right behind the Beatles for the next three or four weeks. Uh, a, a song sung by a girl. She was just 17, you know what I mean. Um, rose to number two and stayed there uh, and would have been number one were it not for Beatlemania. 
The message of the song was truly revolutionary. It was written by two men, but Leslie Gore had been known before for singing about uh, how she was crying at her party because Judy stole her boyfriend and then how it's now Judy's turn to cry. It was a real sign that women were awakening. Um, not so much <laughs> that it was written by men and that she was singing it, but the reception to it showed how uh, the country and particularly women were ready for this. You don't own me. I'm not just one of your many toys. And please, when I go out with you, don't put me on display because you don't own me. Don't try to change me in any way. Whoops, okay, that's what Chris warned me about. All right, here we go. Uh, that's some more of the uh, lyrics there. Now that was revolutionary, and I would argue is kind of the ultimate revolution. I don't have time to get into it. It involves other books, including one I wrote before and probably the next one I'm going to do. Uh, but I believe that the idea that man is superior to woman is the model on which all other hierarchies are based. So this is kind of the ultimate revolutionary idea. It was also in 1964 that the feminine mystique, which had come out in hardcover in 1963 and done pretty well in paperback, just became an enormous bestseller. Before February was over, a brash young boxer with the melodious name of Cassius Marcellus Clay, uh, who had been close, become close friends with Malcolm X, startled the sports world and the larger world by defeating Sonny Liston to become world heavyweight boxing champions. Days later, the leader of the Nation of Islam changed his, uh, uh, Clay's name to Muhammad Ali. Both he and Malcolm X would have an enormous impact on the 60s and continuing on in American history, although in the case of Malcolm, that would uh, mainly come after he was murdered before the long 1964 uh, was over. Um, <clears throat> clearly, the change for which Sam Cooke was hoping in his song uh, was coming very rapidly. Of all the things that I was just mentioning, except for the Stones' arrival in May, all of them happened in like the first seven weeks of 1964. Um, history is punctuated by discontinuities uh, in the trajectory that will alter the trajectory. The key to the occurrence of these turns these, these rapid changes is usually less a leader, although in the case of 1964, Lyndon Johnson's ability to deal with Congress, his insistence on doing something to help the poor, uh, to, to try to end racial discrimination, uh, was very important. The main reason why this was such a turning point is if you get leadership that is wanting to move in a direction where the environment is uh, ripe for it. And that was uh, very clearly the case in like biological terms, a, a environmental niche was there for progressive ideas. On January 8th, 1964, uh, President Johnson, only president for a matter of weeks since the assassination, gave his first State of the Union address in which he called for an unconditional war on poverty. Five days later, Columbia Records released Bob Dylan's third album, The Times They Are Changing. It seems to have gone un unnoticed both at that time and since, but the messages of Johnson's speech and Dylan's song were pretty much on the same wavelength. Uh, and they're occurring at almost exactly the beginning of this year, 1964. They're drastically different, obviously, in tone and approach, but they're basically talking about the same thing. When Dylan sang about the chance not coming again and the loser being later to win, he could have been channeling the new president. Those words almost exactly reflect how Lyndon Johnson saw the situation, this opportunity, an opportunity in part because he had long wanted to become president and the opportunity had just arisen because he uh, took over after JFK, an opportunity also that Johnson saw he could use the assassination and people's reaction to it to get more support for this sort of thing. Um, Dylan and Johnson, the poet and the president almost seemed to be singing a duet. 
This synchronicity was, of course, entirely unplanned. Dylan had written the song a few months earlier in late 1963 when JFK was still alive, and some of the ideas in it were presumably a reflection of what JFK was uh, effectively talking about but wasn't able to achieve, although much more than that, stimulated by what was going on and the bold actions of civil rights workers. The sort of convergence that happened between Dillon and Johnson is usually referred to as mere coincidence. Coincidence certainly it was, but was it mere? Uh, when two things happen uh, uh, simultaneously, um, it is called a coincidence, but some coincidences are not just accidental. Some clearly reflect something in the time, and that's why they're occurring that way. Um, the sort of convergence uh, that happened with the song and uh, Johnson's speech, it seems to me, were not mere coincidence. When a friend of Dylan's happened to pick up a copy of uh, the Times They Are Changing that he was working on in uh, September of 1963, and he came to the line, come senators, congressmen, please heed the call, he said, what's this? I'll change the word to crap, man. Um, Dylan's response was, well, you know, it seems to be what people like to hear. And that's just the point. Such a coincidence in the musician's words and the arguments of an activist president suggests that something was in the air and what was in the air or blowing in the wind in 1964 was a desire to improve the conditions of society's losers. The enthusiasm with which many Americans greeted LBJ's call for fundamental change indicates that like Dylan Johnson was voicing sentiments that were in the air at the time uh, and the reaction of audiences to them uh, uh, indicate this. Um, they would never have been capable of harmonizing. Um, I'm pretty confident uh, that uh, Johnson couldn't sing very well. I never heard him try. Um, Dylan, Dylan writes great songs. Uh, I, I couldn't carry a tune to save my life, but I always say I can do a passable Bob Dylan. In any event, they couldn't have harmonized, but what they were saying harmonized with the feelings of a large portion of the people. And if this had been a musical duet, the appropriate name for it would have been Zeitgeist. Let's turn to what I think is kind of the question at the center of American history. Um, the uh, broader context um, that we're looking at uh, is, is really reflective of what's happened throughout American history. Well, you see in this poster the motto of the 1868 Democratic presidential uh, uh, team and remember, in those days, the parties were almost entirely reversed from what they are now, um, is, again, the, the question of America. Is this a country for white men in which white males should rule? That has been the question since the, well, really since 1607, even before enslaved people were brought, as English people arrived in Virginia in a land already occupied by people with darker skins. You know, what would become the United States uh, became increasingly and has more and more ever since become the most diverse society in the world. And can we accept that? In 2019, the 400th anniversary of the first arrival of enslaved Africans in Virginia in a territory that would become part of the United States, the New York Times uh, launched a project called the 1619 Project, which identifies that development of enslaved people arriving in what would become America as one of, and I want to emphasize one of, not, they don't say the, but one of the defining moments of American history. Opponents swiftly countered with arguments supporting the traditional view that what America is all about is the ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And the question became a culture war litmus test. But 1619, 1776 is not an either-or question. It's not a choice. It's a both-end. 
Surely the greatest of all American paradoxes, and we are, as the historian Michael Kamen put it in the title of a book some decades ago, a people of paradox. The greatest of those paradoxes is that this land of freedom uh, has been since long before we became an independent country, also a land of enslavement. Much of American history can be seen as a tension between these two things, which can be seen as a tension between the slavery that began in 1619 and the ideals that were set forth in 1776. Um, those who have attacked the 1619 project have conveniently ignored that in her introduction to it, Nicole Hannah-Jones wrote, quote, the year 1619 is as important to America as 1776. Not more important, but as important. And it seems to me that assertion should not be controversial. The paradox that is the United States took bodily form in Thomas Jefferson. He enunciated the radical vision with its majestic ideals of freedom and equality, but failed very much to be able to live up to them. Make no mistake, though, those ideals, that vision, remain the promise of America. But as a song sung by the freedom singers during the Mississippi summer of 1964 reminds us, they say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. I'm not going to try to sing it. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. Oh, Lord, we've struggled so long. We must be free. We must be free. That is, that the ideals of America are so much worth continuing always to work for, but it's a constant struggle. It's, it's not like anything that's ever going to be achieved, and then we can all just sit back and rest. The basic question, another way to put it, is particularly since the population became so diverse, can democracy work in a very diverse nation? That's um, it's a picture of, of uh, Lincoln uh, giving the Gettysburg Address. Let's update Lincoln's words in Gettysburg in November of 1963. Twelve score and seven years ago, our fathers, along with some mothers, brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all humans are created equal. We have been throughout our history, and very much still are, engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Democracy is a truly American ideal. Um, I certainly don't have time to get into it here, but it now seems pretty clear that the ideals of the Enlightenment on which Jefferson and Madison and all these other founders were basing the United States actually were ideals that came to France and England from some of the indigenous uh, people in Eastern North America. Um, and when you think about it, that really makes sense because how are the ideas of people ruling themselves, power coming from the bottom up of democracy going to arise in Europe where essentially everything was top down. The great chain of being, God, monarchs, popes, cardinals, the idea of democracy, yeah, there had been sort of democracy long, long ago in ancient Athens, but there's nothing like that going on in Europe, but it was going on among indigenous people in uh, Eastern North America. Democracy and the equality of all humans is such a radical idea. Um, it's something that appeals to people, maybe even particularly to people who don't have power. Um, if you're going to say that power comes up from below rather than down from above, and going to say that everybody should have equal, equal participation in governing uh, and making the decisions, um, that has to be especially appealing to people who have been excluded, to, to women, uh, to people uh, of various minority groups, uh, to refugees, to other sorts of immigrants, to people uh, without substantial property or inheritance. And that has been true. 
um, to a remarkable extent. People who are, were excluded, certainly people from other parts of the world, uh, come here believing more in American ideals than most of us who were born here do. Um, why do they want to come here? Because it's so attractive. Um, the same thing is true of, I don't know how you'd figure out percentages, but over the years, even enslaved people and later those suffering under segregation, African Americans, by and large, have very much believed in, in that ideal. Um, the poet Langston Hughes uh, probably put it best in uh, 1936, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. It was in the long 1964 that the full promise of 1776 was for the first time opened up to those for whom the legacy of 1619 had for so long uh, been denying it to them. Through the 24th Amendment, eliminating the poll tax, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, banning racial discrimination, <clears throat> and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, opening the vote to all, the United States became, during this period, for the first time, a full democracy. Those who opposed extending the promise of America to others had, in 1964, two prominent political champions. Barry Goldwater wasn't really a champion of that, but he certainly was taken that way by a lot of his supporters. He wasn't a notably racist man. He had been a, a longtime member of the NAACP, but he had voted against uh, the Civil Rights Act, uh, interestingly enough, persuaded by Robert Bork and a couple of other people that uh, this was unconstitutional, and so he voted against it. And this led to his enormous popularity among white supremacists, which may not have been uh, uh, accurate as far as he was concerned. In 1964, um, right-wing people took over not the Republican Party as a whole, which continued to have many moderate and even liberal people, uh, including a lot of office holders, but they had worked over the previous four years at like precinct levels to take over the machinery of the party in many states, and they totally dominated the party's 1964 national convention in San Francisco. Um, the mood there was uh, very much summed up. Well, you could look at just the numbers. Uh, the party of Lincoln in 1964 had a little over 1,300 delegates at its national convention, only 14 of whom were black. Those delegates, those African-American delegates, were, quote, shoved, pushed, spat upon, and cursed with a liberal sprinkling of racial epithets. One of those delegates, um, a lifelong Republican, Jackie Robinson, said that being on the floor of his party's 1964 convention led him to believe that now I know what it felt like to be a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Robinson had integrated the national pastime, but now he was witnessing the disintegration of his national party, whose support for people who looked like him suddenly seemed to have become something from a past time. Fortunately, that didn't continue in the, in the near-term future. As late as, I believe, it was 2006, uh, every Republican senator voted to renew the Voting Rights Act. In recent years, every Republican senator has voted against even discussing renewing the Voting Rights Act. Um, another option for those who were intent on keeping white supremacy was provided by George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, who ran in a few primaries against Lyndon Johnson for the Democratic nomination. Notice, I don't know whether you can see it there, I tried to highlight it, uh, the, the white party, it says. In the general election, Johnson won the largest percentage of the vote, what sometimes people call the popular vote, I just call it the vote because it's the vote, the electoral vote isn't really the vote. Anyway, uh, that has ever been won, uh, well over 61% of the vote. Um, however, why don't you take a look at this map that shows by county 
the level of support for Johnson and the level of support for Goldwater. Goldwater carried only five states in the Deep South and barely, by less than 1%, his home state of Arizona. But if you look at where the support for Goldwater is most intense, it becomes pretty clear um, to those who are, who are, how do you put it, in the fact-based community to figure out what that was all about. If you think about, um, and, and you know, the, the, uh, the black belt of Alabama and Mississippi, but even almost all the rest of Mississippi, and remember, of course, that um, the voters in Mississippi, almost an entirely an all-white electorate, this is still before the Voting Rights Act, um, if you look at what had happened in Mississippi in the past, this is even more striking, the, the political breakdown in 1964. Since 1890, when the Mississippi Constitution was rewritten by a convention that consisted of 134 men, 133 of whom were white, and one was black in a state which at that time had a majority black population, and a convention which was openly called for the purpose of keeping black people from voting. Um, since then, when the electorate was almost all white, no Republican had received, with a couple of exceptions I'll mention in a moment, even a double digit of the percentage of the vote. It was just unheard of. You know, people, as they say, promised granddaddy on his deathbed they would always vote the straight Democratic ticket. Uh, the only exceptions to that, the only time that they even broke 15 percent, the Republicans, uh, were in 1928 and 1960. What did they have in common? Well, I will uh, tell you so you don't have to think about it. The Democratic nominee was a Catholic. Um, <laughs> But even then, they, they were uh, still getting a distinct minority of it. The only other times, the only time they got above 15%, the Republican presidential candidate in Mississippi, was with Dwight Eisenhower, a war hero, running in 1952 and 1956. But even Eisenhower never got even 40% of the white vote. In 1964, Goldwater got 87% of the Mississippi vote. Um, and again, that pretty much says uh, what that was all about. Um, speaking of Mississippi, uh, Mississippi was, of course, uh, the center of much of what was going on uh, during 1964. Um, let me tell one story that I think is illustrative of how dangerous it was in Mississippi for the people who were living here and wanted to uh, uh, change the racial situation and those coming to join in the struggle. A uh, story that freedom workers in Mississippi like to tell uh, was of a young black man in Chicago who awakened in the middle of the night to hear a voice saying, go to Mississippi. And he started sweating and shaking, go to Mississippi. And he shook some more and he said, well, well, Lord, I'll go if you'll come with me. And the voice replied, I'll be with you all the way, son, as far as Memphis. <laughs> um, a song which I would have played if we'd been able to play songs uh, by Phil Oaks called Here's to the State of Mississippi. Uh, for underneath her borders, this is from 1964, the devil draws no lines. If you drag her muddy rivers, nameless bodies you will find. Oh, the fat trees in the forest have hid a thousand crimes. The calendar is lying when it says the present time. Oh, here's the land you've torn the heart out of. Mississippi, find yourself another country to be part of. Well, Mississippi had tried that in the past. Um, here are a few other images that I'm just going to go through very quickly for the sake of time of what made Mississippi the center stage in 1964. Um, the murder of the uh, three civil rights workers in Neshoba. Uh, this is a Klan poster. Bob Moses, a leading figure in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, with uh, Wanted Dead or Alive, a, a reward will be paid by the Klan. Um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, going to the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City 
and uh, trying to get the all-white regular Democratic uh, delegation removed and so they would replace them. Um, they're on the, uh, the, the boardwalk uh, there marching. I was actually there one day myself. I just graduated from high school and was in New Jersey and sort of marched with them a bit, but I obviously was not central to it, but I was supporting them even at that time. Um, the person who emerged from that convention most notably was Fannie Lou Hamer, and I wish we could uh, play a song of her singing there, but she's singing on the boardwalk there. Um, the regular Mississippi all-white delegation, all but four of them refused to sign a pledge to support the Democratic national ticket and abandoned their seats, whereupon the Freedom Democrats, using borrowed credentials, uh, took over the seats. Um, here, Annie Devine, Mrs. Hamer, and Ed King. I don't know whether anybody can identify the guy who's uh, photobombing that. I'm not sure who it is. Um, but such positive change came out of the long 1964, much of what came out in the long 1964 came from the Mississippi Summer Project. To give a couple of examples, the democratization and diversification of the Democratic Party's nominating uh, process. Part of the compromise, and I wish I had time to get into that, of how Johnson was forced to do that. Um, part of the compromise was that in the future, Democratic delegations would reflect the Democratic electorate of that state. And so unless you're talking about North Dakota or someplace, that, well, North Dakota should have uh, Native Americans, but unless you're talking about someplace that was essentially all white, there wouldn't be any more all white delegations. And by 1972, the Democratic convention that year, uh, just looking at it, it was a convention that looked like America. Half women, all sorts of different ethnic groups. Uh, of course, in terms of ideology, it wasn't that at all, but just the way you looked at it. So that was a huge change. Um, the student movement uh, that arose in 1964, where spreading to white students beyond uh, those who uh, had been working in the civil rights movement earlier in the 60s was a direct outgrowth of the Mississippi Summer Project. Mario Savio, the uh, most important figure in what might be called uh, a California Freedom Fall that followed the Mississippi Freedom Summer, uh, had been working in it, had been arrested here, and became the leading figure in that here. He's being uh, dragged off by uh, police in, in Berkeley during that. Um, so the student movements coming out of that, the women's liberation movement as opposed to the more mainstream Betty Friedan, uh, now part of the movement, also got what many people identify as its uh, start in the Mississippi Freedom Summer when Mary King and Casey Hayden pictured here wrote an anonymous paper on the position of women in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, for a reassessment uh, conference that was held on the coast in Waveland that fall. Uh, it didn't stay anonymous for long, but uh, this and a, another version of it that was published more than a year later are often seen as really what launched women's liberation, the more radical part of that. Um, a story that goes with that that is um, uh, something that kind of propelled it into more uh, notice than might otherwise have happened was that uh, one of the SNCC leaders, Stokely, Stokely Carmichael, uh, they went out on a boardwalk uh, or, or a, 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 a um, what do you call it, going out, a, 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 a dock, that's what you would call it, uh, with, with a gallon of wine that night and he knew who had written it and he said, the only position for women in SNCC is prone. Um, out of such statements, movements are born. It, he gets a bad rap for that, as they said. He, he should have been a stand-up comic, and he was just making a joke, and he was really much more favorable to women in the movement than a lot of other people were. But that got all sorts of attention and brought a lot more attention to it. The summer project innovation that I want to focus a little more attention on this afternoon relates directly to a major issue before us today. 
In addition to trying to register people to vote and challenging the all-white delegation at the Democratic National Convention, the Mississippi Summer Project created freedom schools in Mississippi. Beyond teaching black children in Mississippi reading, writing, and arithmetic that they were not getting remotely sufficiently in the segregated, separate, and grossly unequal schools of the state, they also taught the children black history. They taught children, many of whom said they had no idea that people who looked like them had any history. And this is really not entirely, but a major part of how a wider sort of history uh, started to, to spread, of, of black history, of women's history, of all sorts of other histories that had been ignored. Um, it was the beginning of the teaching of a much more inclusive and diverse American history, precisely the sort of inclusive and truthful history that so many Republican politicians are now trying to ban. The 1964 also saw a move on the national level toward a more truthful history, a move, again, that Republicans today seem to want to reverse and reinstate the whitewashed so-called history that existed before 1964. 1964 is sometimes referred to as the end of an age of innocence. When it comes to history, it would be better to call it the end of an age of ignorance of guilt. It's often inaccurately said that history is a story written by the winners. That's usually the case. Yet, stunningly, Beginning a few decades after the Enslavers' Rebellion, more popularly known as the Civil War, um, the story of that war of enslavement, of reconstruction that spread across the nation was the loser's version. Um, a story uh, that came to be seen as stories of a land of cavaliers and cotton fields, moonlight and magnolias, um, friendly masters and happy singing slaves and of a glorious lost cause that they fought for, followed by a horrible black reconstruction where ignorant black people were ruling over and harming white people. That was taught as accurate history from at least the end of the 19th century into the 1960s, not just in the South, but across the country. Um, it, uh, skip over a little bit of this, but I'll, I'll just mention uh, this inverted history. Um, one of the ways it would spread most rapidly, one of the most notorious ways, was through the 1915 film Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. Um, the way, uh, the reason this happened seems to be a sort of tacit uh, compromise that was made to try to bring the two sides of the war together, that is, the white people of the two sides, by which the South would accept that the Union is indissoluble, that uh, they, they can't separate from the Union, and most Northern whites would accept the Southern view of innate inferiority of black people. And this was was pushed in history books. It was pushed particularly by D.W. Griffith. The idea of bringing the country together, that is the white country together, uh, and the movie actually says in this title card, uh, the coming together of the Aryan nation. That's the nation that's being born, birth of a nation. People hear the name. Uh, most people have heard of the movie. Most people haven't seen it. They've heard it's racist. You can't believe how racist it is if you don't watch it. And everybody should watch it. Every American should see it. Sit through three hours of it once. I've had to see it about 30 times, which I think is banned uh, by the Constitution as cruel and unusual punishment. But, um, but this is the idea. It, you would think it was about the American Revolution. That's not, no, it's about the birth of a united nation just like I was saying that the South agrees that they can't leave the nation, but that that nation is the Aryan birthright. Um, by the period after World War II, the Cold War mentality was such that the whitewashing of American history uh, was becoming even more complete. 
When I was in grade school and high school in the 1950s and early 1960s uh, in New Jersey, uh, the textbooks taught a history that um, indicated that nothing bad has ever happened in the United States. There was really um, no mention of anything happening to the indigenous people. It was just that uh, the story of winning the West without any indication of what was happening to the people who were losing the West. They did have to mention that slavery had existed and maybe that wasn't such a good thing, but they quickly got over that and then said, and we ended that. After which, if you read the uh, textbooks, it seemed that black people just disappeared from the United States with the exception of Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver, who were doing some marvelous things with the, the peanut, but otherwise that was it. And again, this was in New Jersey and it was that way everywhere. This inverted history had an enormous impact on the lives of at least three generations of Americans that, although diminished, is still with us. Um, I guess it's a safe assumption that this is not what Dylan had in mind uh, when he said the losers now will be later to win, uh, but the losers told that history. Um, and so um, in 1964, besides the freedom schools in Mississippi, there was a, a change in, in among academic historians. In September of 1964, there was a headline in the New York Times book review that said, quote, a shadow stretched across our history for 100 years, and it was a review of some new histories of Reconstruction telling the truth about Reconstruction, that it was actually a progressive era that was working to and to some extent succeeding in doing good things for poor white people as well as uh, the so-called freedmen. Um, and, and that came back in along with some older histories that had been ignored before that. And so the whitewashed history is another thing that 1964 was beginning uh, to uh, turn around. Um, those who seek uh, to turn us back now appreciate that control over the past goes a long way towards gaining control of the present and the future, and so they very much want to do it. Again, the call is to make America great again and to take America back mean to take America back in two senses, back from people who are not white and male and back to the time before 1964 when it truly did seem to be a white man's country and straight white males, at least pretending to be straight even if they weren't, uh, were in charge. Um, and so um, this, the effect of all this today is part of an attempt at, after Reconstruction, the white seizure of rule again in the South is referred to restoration, the attempt to uh, affect another restoration of white man's rule. Um, in October 2020, Donald Trump announced that he would create a 1776 commission to, quote, combat anti-American historical revisionism and promote patriotic education. Patriotic education is what authoritarian regimes do. Actual patriotic education would be telling the truth. All countries have horrible things in their past, and to ignore them uh, is not going to get us anywhere, but if you want an authoritarian way of looking at things, you hide uh, those things. States under right-wing control now are competing with one another to ban uh, books and to enact the most restrictive laws on what may be taught in their schools, especially about racism. The Republican-controlled Texas legislature in 2021 enacted uh, laws on specifically what must be taught and what must not be taught. Excluded were the 15th Amendment, which prohibits the federal government and states from denying or abridging the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the history of Native Americans, these are all quotes that are in the law, and documents on the separation of church and state. You know, of course, this was founded as a Christian nation when 
I don't know whether any of you are, have ever like read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. They specifically, you won't find Jesus in there. You won't even find God in there. You will find a nature's God, which is sort of a, a deist thing in the Declaration. They intentionally were separating church and state, but our children can't know about that. Uh, leaving out the women's movement, the Chicano movement, the labor movements, and existing standards in Texas for the teaching about the ways in which white supremacy Slavery, eugenics, and the Ku Klux Klan are morally wrong, which was in the standards in Texas before 2021, uh, had to be removed. Texas, where non-Hispanic white people are already a minority, is trying to go back to the days of making it a white man's state. And of course, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is banning books and doing his worst to turn February into a race Black History Month. He banned the AP course in African American history. Florida schools uh, keep covering over their school libraries with paper so that the kids can't get to books that might be dangerous for them. Dangerous meaning these might make white kids feel bad. Um, they have had schools in Florida that recently have removed from their libraries biographies of baseball stars Roberto Clemente and Hank Aaron um, because, you know, white kids might feel bad if even black star athletes were discriminated against. They can't know about that. White feelings, in short, are more important, it seems, than black reality. Where we are today was perfectly captured in 1964 in a song that very few people are familiar with, lots of music from 1964 you are familiar with. Um, Tom Paxton, What Did You Learn in School Today? Um, I'll go through just a little about this, of this. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned that Washington never told a lie. I learned that soldiers never seldom lie, die. I learned that everybody is free, and that's what my teacher said to me. And that's what I learned in school today. That's what I learned in school. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I won't keep repeating it. I learned the policemen are my friends. I learned justice never ends. I learned that murderers pay for their crimes, even if we make mistakes sometimes. They must die. Uh, and that's the, what I learned in school today. What did you learn in school? I learned that war is not so bad. I learned about the great ones we have had. We fought Germany and France, and someday I might get my chance. That's what I learned in school today. I learned our government must be strong. It's always right and never wrong. Our leaders are the finest men, and we elect them again and again. And that's what I learned in school today. Um, Freedom, of course, is what America is all about. And uh, I, I finally noticed behind the spotlight there where the clock is. Uh, I, I guess we're not going to be talking. Nobody wants to hear about freedom. Um, uh, I want to, uh, though, mention, though, this, this double helix. As I see it, there were two competing types of freedom um, where black people were seeking the freedom that white people had of being able to be on the inside, being able to participate politically, but especially young white people wanted increasingly what they imagined to be black freedom, to not be held back by the mores of society. And um, I talk about that quite a bit in the book. Um, let me really quickly, uh, yeah, there's something here, uh, Ronald Reagan. Okay, this um, is, is really important. That one of the things that came out of 1964 um, they began in 1958 polling people on whether they trusted the government. And the highest level of trust in the government was reached in October of 1964 at 77%. Um, it began to decline after that and got down finally in uh, 2017 to 17%, ticked up a little bit after that. But that is one of the, uh, the legacies of this. Um, and it's, it's really ironic that this happened under Lyndon Johnson, who perhaps, with the exception of FDR, more believed in what government could do for people than any other person who's been president. But 
he had the unfortunate habit that was described by uh, reporters who covered him. They said, you can tell a lot about Lyndon Johnson by his mannerisms. They said, if he touches his earlobe, he's telling the truth. If he smooths down the hair on the back of his head, he's telling the truth. But if he moves his lips, he's lying. <laughs> and that was pretty much true. The guy lied when there was no reason to lie, and he was followed by Richard Nixon, and you know about him. So between the two of them, that did a lot of that. Um, and so, it, it, and not just the lying, but of course another thing in 1964 that's really going the wrong way uh, is the Vietnam War, which I talk about in the book, but don't have time to talk about here. Vietnam did this to LBJ. He accomplished uh, so much that if it were not for Vietnam, well, he might be up there on Mount Rushmore. Okay, um, got a, a few other things that I'd like to say, but again, it's mainly the choice before us in the 2020s, it seems to me, is more and more coming down to we, do we want to continue and improve upon the positive changes that were made, especially in the mid-1960s, or do we want to reverse them all? And for the sake of time, I'll have to stop there. Thank you. We have a few minutes available for questions. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. Got one in the back. Thank you very much. The, um, the zeitgeist putting Johnson and Dylan together, I found particularly almost amusing. Uh, I want to tell a, a story from, from my past. I was living in 1968 in Evanston, Illinois, having just completed a PhD at Northwestern. And in 64, I had voted for Goldwater and because I didn't trust Johnson. But by 1968, so the legacy of the zeitgeist when Johnson decided he was not going to run. There was, in 1968, that long spring with the assassinations and the uh, rebellion against the policies in Vietnam that pretty much um, erupted in, in Chicago in the Democratic National Convention. They had the police riot, you may remember, against the hippies and the yippies and the anti-fascists who uh, came down to Chicago to try to continue the legacy of the civil rights movement and other like-minded um, problems. But I was sitting in Evanston watching my television set and I was seeing the police attacking these mostly young people, driving them out of Lincoln Park, have them reassemble down in uh, oh, Grant Park. Thank you. Um, and so I got on my little Honda motorcycle and drove down the outer drive to Grant's Park. Uh, interesting co conjunction of presidents, Johnson and Grant. But the, uh, the, the demonstrators were all scattered around Grant's Park, right in front of the Conrad Hilton Hotel, where the convention was taking place. And I got there, and I started into the park, and there was uh, there were some people there who who were well known. One of them was Peter Yarrow of the uh, Peter Paul and Mary trio, and Peter got a hold of a microphone and sang. What? Can you guess? The times they are a changing, and as I looked around, you know all these mostly young kids sitting around. I was only, what, 26 at the time, something like that. And they, um, 
he got to the verse, come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. And something's rapidly, something, the and the times, rapidly and, the, and the times, they are a changing. And there was not, believe me, a single person in the park who wasn't crying, especially if they were under 30 years old. And the resonance of Dylan in that situation where uh, Johnson had given up the reins of, of power and it looked like everything was gone was again connected for me with Phil Oakes whose next record album put a tombstone on the cover and it said, Phil Oakes, born such and such, died Chicago, 1968, which of course he hadn't, he committed suicide later. But um, there was, the times were a change. And, but the, the one thing you mentioned at the very end, and I, I don't want to make this too much longer, that what those people were doing in the park that day was not so much about race and racism. It was about war mm -hmm. and authoritarian uses of war, empirical uses, not empirical, but imperial uses of war. And strangely enough, uh, there were relatively few protests about the uh, the racism that was still very much a part of, of this country in 68. Even as, you know, we were still uh, grieving the deaths of um, Bobby Kennedy and um, Martin Luther King. Yeah, I got them re reversed in my mind. But the, um, yeah. Chris says we got to switch. Stop. I've got to stop. <laughs> you have any comments on that? Um, no, I mean, of course, uh, of course, I was. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that um, when Johnson announced he wasn't running, I leaped into the air. I mean, I hated the man with a passion. Uh, he's such a complicated person. Um, he did so much good. You're absolutely right to not trust him in 1964. He was corrupt. Uh, but you know this extraordinary mixture of, of good and evil. But basically, I think that little equation is right, that he did so much good that if he had, and the reason he got into Vietnam was largely in his masculine insecurity, recordings, but I know we can't do this, but we must be men about it. And, and so uh, I talk about that a lot in the book. But. Speaking of the book. The times they were a change in 1964, the year the 60s arrived and the battle lines of today were drawn. We have copies of it for sale over here. If uh, you have a question, I'm sure Rob will be glad to answer it for you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Come back next week when we'll have Danielle Dreilinger talking about the secret history of home economics. It's a great book. Uh, today, help me thank Robert McElvain for this fabulous program.